We are live for Beyond the Game, my podcast, where I go over all sorts of amazing things that have to do with sports cards and business and relationships and life and everything in between. And if you don't know who I am, hi, my name is Eric Michael. I've sold over $5 million in sports cards, and I started a coaching program teaching people how to make money with sports cards about four years ago, and it's changed a lot of people's lives. I think sports cards is the simplest, easiest way to make an extra few thousand dollars a month. I love to teach it. I've been doing it for 10 years myself, and that's who I am. And I have a bunch of amazing things to talk about here that I think are pretty interesting. So the first two things I have to talk about, they go, kind of go hand in hand. So I had an employee tell me that someone made a post about me in a Facebook group saying I was shady or I was a scam, something along those lines. And I think it's interesting. So I'll, I'll always say this to the day I die. I think... The word scam and shady, like nobody is a scam. Nobody is shady. It's like a spectrum, right? It's like you could be more shady, more a scam, or less shady, less a scam. Someone is a scam if you're paying them money and people they're taking your money and running to Las Vegas and stealing it. It's not what I do. But I have invested probably over a quarter million dollars into like coaching programs, online education, mentorship, all sorts of stuff like that. All the things that a lot of people think are a scam because there's this notion online that if anyone's selling something online, it's a scam. I don't know why. It's just how it is. And I could tell you every single thing I've learned in business, not with sports cards, but with business, with like major league profits and how I've built it, and we have over 30 employees, we do all sorts of amazing things. Every single thing I learned how to market, how to produce content, how to manage a sales team, how to get people to be successful, I knew none of this stuff four years ago. Every single thing I've learned, when I say everything, I mean every single thing I've learned has been from the ads you see online, people promoting the idea of making money, doing something. Every single thing I've learned was from joining coaching programs. So I'm a first test to say that this stuff is not a scam, but I actually, well, I shouldn't say that. I I was scammed one time. Someone took $30,000 from me and tried to run off with it, essentially. That's a whole other story. But I'll always think it's interesting to the day I die. And what's fascinating about coaching and paying money to people in college is when you join co- when you join a college and someone's a freshman in college by the way I see you Instagram and Facebook live when someone joins a college and they fail out their freshman year because they were partying too much and they were drinking they blame themselves because they didn't do their homework but when someone fails out of a coaching program they tend to blame the person that's running the coaching program or their coach when fundamentally it's the same thing right a coaching program going to math class it's the same exact thing at the end of the day here's the information if you execute on it, like if you do your homework and you study the textbook, you'll become good at algebra. If you don't, you're going to stink and you're probably going to fail the class. It's same the same thing with making money or productivity programs or dating programs. I've bought a few dating programs in my life. And honestly, a lot of them are really helpful. And it's the same exact thing. If you bu- Here's the information. This is what I've learned over the course of X amount of years doing this thing. If you do what I say, you'll probably be successful. If you don't, you'll probably stink. That's how it goes. Um, So that's a side note. But anyways, piggybacking off of that is, and this is a question for the audience. I want you guys to comment because I want your kind of like mindset and what goes through your head. So when people see an ad online, immediately they think, scam, he's trying to sell me something. There is nothing wrong with buying something or trying to sell something to someone. Okay, let me give you an example. The best, one of the best purchases I ever made in my life was my king size tempur mattress. It's absolutely amazing. It gets eight degrees cooler than room temperature. It's freaking incredible. Now, I bought this mattress in New York and it's funny because I bought this mattress in New York and I refused to get rid of it. I lived in Arizona, I lived in Texas and now I live in Florida. I'm never moving again, but I, I, it goes with me everywhere I go. And it's amazing. And I walked into that mattress store, you know, wanting to spend about $1,000, maybe $2,000 for a mattress. And the person that was in the store, it was a mattress firm who was trying to sell me the mattress, your classic 
sales guy. Slick back, greasy hair, a little bit overweight, talks very fast, just vintage. Vintage sales guy. And that's people like this are why sales get a bad rap. And he could sniff that I had money with the car he saw me pull up in. I don't know. He knew I had money. And instead of pitching me on $1,000 mattresses, he was pitching me on $5,000 mattresses and $4,000 mattresses. And the mattress I ended up buying, that king size Tempur-Pedic, it was $5,000. And now some people would have, in that situation, refused to buy that mattress because they, they don't want to be sold. However, I looked at it and I thought, wow, this mattress is, I know it's five times the price of the others, but this is a hundred times better. I'm going to buy it. Did that salesman push me to buy something? Did he pressure me? You bet your ass he did. However, why did he pressure me? Well, number one, of course, he wants a fatter commission check, duh. And number two, he knows that mattress is actually better. And he knows I can afford it. And I'm so thankful he pressured me into buying that $5,000 mattress because it changed my life. So there's nothing wrong with buying something or selling something if it's going to benefit your life. That's how life works. That's what money is, right? Money is a tool to improve your life, make your life better, make your life happier, and it's a tool to also make more money. So think of all the amazing things you've bought in your life, and I'm sure you've bought a bunch of bad things. Think of the best thing you've ever bought. Was it worth it? So seeing these, and I'm not just saying this because I own an online coaching program, but don't be afraid to join something online. I could tell you making money online has changed my life for the better, and I know it could change a lot of people's lives, but so many people have this like resistance to anything online because it gets a bad rap. And when in reality, it gets a bad rap, a lot of this stuff online, because a lot of people don't execute at a high level. So if you're not someone that puts in effort and executes at a high level, I wouldn't buy anything. I would never buy a coaching program. I wouldn't buy any mindset courses or sports card courses or real estate courses. If you're someone that keeps buying things and hopping around and hopping around and hopping around, that probably means you need to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, why is nothing working? Because let me tell you something about business with sports cards and anything. Everything works. You just have to force it to work. Nothing is supposed to be easy. You can buy coaching programs to make your life a lot easier to learn the information right away, but it still takes effort and it still takes work. So that's what I would say. Nothing. Everything in life works. Every type of business works. There's right. There's billion dollar garbage disposal businesses. There's billion dollar real estate businesses. There's million dollar sports card businesses. It's just a matter of you staying persistent, having the right mindset and forcing it to work, which is why you see me talk about mindset all the time. Cause I believe so many people have such a bad mindset specifically when it comes to making money. I have a lot of flaws in my life. I have way too many to count. I've, I have a lot of not good things. I'm sure people, if they looked at my life would say, wow, this is a problem. However, I do know for one thing for certain, one problem I do not have is my mindset when it comes to making money. I fully understand that money is a tool to make more money. And once you understand that, and then you have the right, and you pair that with the right mindset when it comes to investing in yourself, because fundamentally, that is the best thing you could ever do. Because putting money in a 401k or investing in the S&P 500, you might make five, seven, eight, ten 10% a year, but that's not changing your life. And even if you have a few hundred thousand dollars by the time you retire, well, you're 65 years old. A lot of people who I speak to want to make a few grand extra a month now. That's the way to change your life because at the end of the day, life is just about happiness, okay? And if you could make an extra four grand a month right now and add that on top of your monthly paycheck, that is changing your life and that is why you invest in programs and you know invest money to change your life. So hopefully that makes sense. That's just kind of like my view on when it comes to money. Because let me tell you something. Let me, let me tell you something that is not going to sound correct, but it is correct. Money does buy happiness. Take that from my, from my own experience. There's an asterisk next to it. As long as the relationships in your life are right. If your relationships and the foundation, because the, the relationships you have in your life are the foundation of your life. And in my specific ex life, I'm very fortunate where I have very close with my business partner. We're best of friends. I have a few employees that are my good friends as well. I have great friends from back home. I'm still with the same friends from like kindergarten, believe it or not. You know, I have one of those group chats where no one stops talking about football and gambling and prop bets and it's probably not healthy, but I have great relationships in my life. 
And once that is set in stone, money elevates and could buy you happiness. Because if you have an amazing girlfriend, for example, and now you make an extra $5,000 a month and you can go to Hawaii or go on an extra few vacations a year, last time I checked, that's happiness, right? Going on more vacations is happiness. Are you not ha happier when you're on vacation? I know I am. And in my specific example, again, my business partner and I took our families on an all-inclusive uh, five-star vacation a, a year or two ago, to the Dominican Republic. And that can only be done because we make ample amounts of money. I'm not saying that to be cocky or to sound like a dickhead, but I'm saying that because money provides more happiness in your life once your relationships are set in stone. Taking our family on an all-inclusive vacation is happiness. That is happiness. I don't know. Do you guys agree or disagree with me? Take it from my own experience. Maybe I'm just super money hungry and greedy, but the things money could do for you in life, because money is a tool to make your life easier. When your life is easier, it's less stressful. When it's less stressful, you're happier. That's my personal viewpoint and take. But anyways, going on to some stuff, going into sports cards. So I have a bunch of sports card questions from you guys. Uh, and before I go into the questions, I have some interesting buys, some interesting sports card purchases that I... This is not financial advice. I'm not saying you're going to make money on these guys. These, these are just some guys that I'm looking to buy because of where their prices are at and what I think their potential is. One second. Let me take a sip. So right now, if you're watching this or this is being recorded, we are in September. September, to me, is a great time to, to buy baseball, especially the guys that are not, not going to make the playoffs because – they're so low, okay? Buy low, sell high. A good example of someone not to buy is Mets prospect Luis Angel Acuna. His stuff has skyrocketed. I think I was looking the other day, his Bowman Chrome base autograph went from like 70, 80 bucks to like now like 250. Fucking crazy. But that is not how to make money. You could. I'm not saying you can't. That is not the way to make money. These are some sports cards I have to ship out, actually. I, I lost these in a, a sports bet, funny enough. Um, but that is not the way to make money because when something is only an opportunity, when no one else sees it as an opportunity, once everyone sees it as an opportunity, once it gets hot, it's no good anymore. You have to get in before what the player or the card gets hot. That is how to make money. And yeah, it takes a huge set of balls. It does. Like someone I'm looking to buy right now, I have a few names pulled up here. It's like Ellie De La Cruz, great player. His base Bowman Chrome down is down from like it was like 65, 70 bucks. His PSA 10 non-autograph, and now it's around 40. Why? Just because the excitement died, the Reds aren't in the playoffs. Ellie De La Cruz had a really good year. He's a really exciting player. I actually have a blue Bowman Chrome uh back there somewhere. I think it's a solid buy. I think he's at his floor. Will it go up in value? Who knows? But I think I'm putting myself in a good financial position for it to appreciate, right? Buy low, sell high. Look at the guys who their cards have skyrocketed in the past few months. Now, Sam Darnold is one of them. He's obviously having an amazing year, but nobody saw that as an opportunity. That's why his stuff skyrocketed. Look at all the football guys who were high before the football season started, Will Levis and Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud. None of them have went up in value. Even C.J. Stroud was very evidently good because he was so hyped and there was no opportunity or not much opportunity to make money. His cards really aren't up anything and he's having a pretty good year i mean he got the last game against the vikings was not good but that should say something you can't buy stuff when it's inflated if you want to make money it's very hard because especially if they play well it doesn't go up in value if they don't play well it shoots down anthony richardson his value is down in half bryce young disaster his value is down like 30 percent of what it once was will levis his value is down in half don't even get me started on will levis this guy's cost me a lot of money but that's how to make money another good example I don't really know what to think of this player, but I don't know. It's an interesting buy, but Paul Skeens, I usually stay away from pitchers because they don't go up in value well. They don't appreciate that well, but he's a little bit different. He's very exciting, and he's dating Livy Dunn, and his value, not that he's done anything bad. It was really hyped. His Bowman Chrome PSA 10 non-autograph went up to like, 200 bucks maybe a little bit more during the season and now it's down to around 100 for no reason 
just because the excitement died, when the excitement dies, right? Be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. That's just a classy example. I think it could be interesting. Jackson Holiday is another one. His value is down about half of what it once was. So he could be an interesting purchase. I'd probably wait till after the Orioles lose in the playoffs if they do. And someone else who's a young kid who a lot of you guys probably don't know is Ethan Salas. So his Bowman Chrome is from last year, like or his rookie year when his first cards. Very exciting prospect. He's a young catcher for the Padres, and he played like shit this year, and his value tanked in about half. But guys like that, that's why I look at the buy. I try to look at the future and say, who can I see getting a lot of hype and excitement? And like Ellie De La Cruz, right? He's just an exciting player. People get excited when the season comes around. Go back, right? Like back to football, like in February, March, and April. Jordan Love, good example. You could have bought his contenders PSA ten for twelve hundred bucks. Now it's over. Now it was over two thousand. Now it's back down a little bit. Those are the guys where you make your money, where you make a lot of money. And yeah, it's in the when no one sees it as an opportunity. And yeah, it takes a huge set of balls, but that's that's what I think. Um, but anyways, we have some questions. So, <laughs> oh boy. So Gino asked me, what are some boxes you would buy right now? Well, I guess, Gino, you haven't watched any of my content. <laughs> so buying boxes is a losing proposition. It's a great way to lose money. You're just gambling. You might as well go to the casino and pull the slot machine lever. That's all you're doing. Mathematically, it is impossible to win in the long run unless you're like the luckiest son of a gun ever and you pull some massive card that's worth tons and tons of money. I don't recommend doing it. I mean, I'm here to show you guys and try to help you guys make money. Buying box is just a great way to lose money. If I had to buy a box, Prism, because a lot of that stuff you get graded, but I wouldn't buy any boxes, Gino. I would focus on flipping singles and making money. Jack asks, how much does the program cost and what is the amount you would recommend starting with? So we have multiple programs from a few hundred dollars all the way up to thousands of dollars. It just depends on what you're looking to do. I mean, you can get started with any amount of money. It depends on how much money you have. If you have $200 in the bank, I want I'd probably get a job and save money and stop spending so much money. But if that's all you have to invest in cards, I would probably go to I'd probably go start going to sports card shows and going to the dollar boxes on the side and flipping cards. Um, it's probably the easiest way to get started. If you have at least like a thousand or two thousand bucks, I would start by buying cards that are around fifty bucks to a hundred bucks to get graded. And honestly, that's what I would do. Even if you had a hundred thousand dollars, I'd start with grading cards to like prove the concept to yourself and get your feet wet. And if you have like over twenty, thirty grand to mess around with, then that's when I would start to buy cards already graded and hold those in the off season and just flip them close to when the season begins. That's a, it's a great way to make an extra, you know, 20, 30%. Because that's kind of how like sports cards goes, at least in my experience. Buying cards and getting them graded, it's a great way to make, you know, if you're good at it, you can make four or five, six, seven, eight grand a month. But it's there's only so many cards out there you could buy that are in good condition to get graded. It's what do you do with the extra money that's sitting in your bank account instead of it just sitting there, what I do. So like most of the cards I buy are higher end cards already graded because my money is better spent there, hopefully making 20, 30% every three to four months rather than just sitting in my bank account, right? Kind of going back to what I said in the beginning, money is just a tool to make more money. There's so many people that just love to see money grow in their bank account at a slow pace when that's just a bad way to look at money and a bad way to look at life because you should be using that money to make more money. Money in the bank is just money sitting there. Like I get anxious when I have too much money in my bank account because I know that money could be better spent in putting into assets and investing into myself, et cetera. So hopefully that makes sense, Gino. So the answer is don't, or Jack. Um, Casey says, if you were to pick one of the 2024 first round quarterbacks to invest in, who would it be? I think it's Bo Nix. What are your thoughts on the future of soccer cards? All right, so, well, two questions here. So if I had to invest in, well, first of all, so the good quarterbacks, like the ones that got drafted in 2024, they're good cards 
don't actually come out until early 2025. So like February, March, April. So they don't really have many cards to invest in, to be honest with you. And when those cards come out, they're going to be super inflated. Super inflated. So someone, like, I'm just looking ahead into the future. Someone I may love to buy is, let's say we have Knicks, we have Penix, we have Williams, we have May. Jaden Daniels. See, Jaden Daniels is looking like he's the best. So his cards are probably going to be worth a lot of money. Bo Nix is probably... I like Bo Nix personally the most, but once again, when I buy these cards in February, March, and April, I'm buying them in the offseason, trying to get them cheap, maybe get some of them graded, and hold them until like July and August for when the excitement starts to build up and the hype starts to build up, and I'll just flip them then. I'll, ne I'll never hold them until the season because most guys just don't pan out. It's just how it goes. As amazing as I think Bo Nix is and Sean Payton's an amazing coach, it's just how it goes. Just most guys don't end up performing up to expectation. And because of that, I don't want to put my money where I'm probably going to end up losing money, right? So, well, also, like, just use use this year as an example, right? Like, Anthony Richardson, Will Levis, Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, all these guys, everybody was so high on. Like, oh, my God, there's no way any of these guys are going to fail. They all stink, except for Stroud, so far, right? So... That's what I would say. It's never just it's just never worth it to invest in these guys long term. You're playing against the odds. And once in a while, you know, you miss out on someone. Like I can give you an example from my own life. Going into the 2018 season, this was well before Major League Profits and any of this content stuff. I was just doing this stuff myself. Patrick Mahomes was starting. So if you remember, Patrick Mahomes got drafted in 2017. He sat the year from 2017 going to 2018 behind Alex Smith. And they clinched the playoffs, and I believe Mahomes played the last game against the Broncos. He looked pretty good. And back then, football cards weren't like what they are today either. And I remember, you know, Patrick Mahomes was building some excitement and hype because they got rid of Alex Smith, and he was going to finally start. And I was buying his contenders, buying them for about 300 bucks, getting them graded by Beckett, selling them for six, 700 bucks, And I thought I was killing it. I flipped like 10 of them, like a lot. I was, I was doing well. And I sold them all before July and August. I sold all of them in that time period. And he started playing. <laughs> and everyone was like, holy shit, this guy is not a regular guy. And that card I was selling for $600, I thought I was cool, flip, flip, doubling my money, was worth like three grand ASAP. Like by week two, week three, it was crazy. But you can't get hung up on that stuff because you need to think about, about it long term. How many guys, at least in my case, have I flipped and made money on that just aren't worth anything? There's so many, like, I can't even think of them because there's so many. Like, I remember Zion Williamson. His value is like 10% of what it once was. And I flipped so many of his cards, like, way too many to count. I think I still have one or two. But, so that's kind of the way you need to look at it because most guys don't pan out. John ja Morant, even though he's pretty good, his cards were worth so much more money at one point. And I flipped a bunch of them. Just, I mean, Tyler Hero is another one. I can go back year by year by year. 2017, who were some other quarterbacks in 2017? I forget. But like 2018, I know Sam Darnold's back on the rise. I flipped so many Sam Darnold cards that, and when they were worth so much more. Baker Mayfield, his cards were worth so much more. His PSA 10 contenders, I was flipping them for around $2,000 at one point. I think they were worth more. And now it's like a three, dollars $400 card, right? Most guys just don't pan out yet. You have to go in with that expectation. You can't get your emotions involved because guess what? As much as you might think you know, you actually don't know anything. And neither do I, neither do scouts, neither do coaches. It's impossible to predict who these guys, if they're going to be good or not. And we just know most guys don't end up playing well. Hopefully that answers your question. What are your thoughts on the future of soccer cards? Is it a place to put your money or stay away from? My thought is good. <laughs> so sports cards hasn't even really hit Europe like heavy. That's why this is just the beginning. Like Australia, Europe, Asia. Asia and Australia sports cards are a little bit prevalent. Europe, not really. Wait till they get a whiff of sports cards especially because they love soccer, that'll really bump up the soccer market. And I think it'll be a great way to make money because right now with hockey, for example, a great thing to do is buy hockey cards, get them graded, and flip them to people in Canada. It's difficult for people in Canada to get cards graded because of you know, the grading facilities in PSA. It costs them a bunch of money to get cards shipped. And Europe will be the same thing unless PSA or these grading companies come out with a grading facility in Europe, which I doubt they'll do you'll see big premiums between raw cards and graded cards once the soccer cards start to build up steam in Europe. 
would I put my money in it? No, because I could do more with my money by just like buying like the cards you see behind me and holding them, making 20, 30% every few months. Because even if you buy a soccer card now and you sit on it and it doubles in two years or it doubles in a year, me personally, I could have done more with my money in that time for it, in that time frame by just executing on the strategies I teach. And you could as well. All the information I have is on my YouTube. So you could buy cards, get them graded, and make much more money and do much more with your money today rather than just hoping and praying soccer cards go up in value. Because who knows? Maybe Europe will never get a whiff of sports cards, right? We don't know. Um, and I like making predictable, consistent money rather than guessing. Me personally, and that's probably most people. Uh, let's see. So... Anthony says, thank you. Hey, hey, Eric, thank you for being persistent. It's what I need. All right. I, don't, I don't really know what that means. I guess persistent with the content. My question is, I have a good amount of graded cards and numbered one-on-ones. Is it possible to use those later down the line? Uh, I don't really know what that means, Anthony. But if you have a bunch of graded cards and one-on-one cards, I would probably sell them, take the cash, and put it into my system and all the videos you see me talk about with buying cards raw, getting them graded, and selling them. That's what I would do. I don't really know what your question is, Anthony. Sorry. But that's the best answer I got for you. Anonymous person says, what are your thoughts about cleaning and repairing sports cards, creases and corners? Good. You should do it. It's only going to increase the value of a card. It's a great way to make money. I mean, I don't do that stuff. I just really clean the surface. If a corner has a problem with it, I stay away from it. I know there's people that are experts in like fixing corners and I know people who do pretty bad things like trim cards, which is illegal and you're not allowed to do that, which I would not recommend doing. But my thoughts on cleaning cards, you should do it. And your opinion of a cleaning kit where the kit is being sold with various tools to repair damaged cards. I think you're talking about Kurt's card care. Yeah, I mean, Kurt's card care is good. We have a bunch of students that use it. I have coaches that use it. I would probably buy it, especially if you're buying the cards and Sending them in. What are the pros and cons of card cleaning? There really aren't any cons. It's only going to up the value of the card. If you can't clean the card and it's not worth getting graded, not a bad thing. You sell the card, you move on, and if you clean it well and it grades well, you'll make good money. So there really are no cons. It's only pros. I mean, I guess it takes time, but it's well worth your time. All right, Roy. I think you, Roy, this is a comment responding to a YouTube video. I don't understand why sellers need trust. Most cards are sold on slabs. However, I think saving buyers info is a good idea, especially for high-end cards or a particular name. I find trusting someone because you did one or two deals with previously is, previously is a scary slope. I would think you got fleeced a few times on payment. Not worth it, in my opinion. Okay. Um, interesting. So, it's not that... The sell okay, so I know what you're you're responding to a video where I talk about the best place to sell cards is by saving people's contact information, and then you can hit these people up in the future. So you're you're responding to that video, I assume. However, what I would say is one, it's just a matter of being organized. Okay, how, the how they the fact they trust you more matters a little bit, but. One, people do like to do deals with people who they know and people who they like. So if you're a likable person, you're going to get deals done easier. And number two, it's a matter of being organized. So imagine right now if – just think about this for a second. Here, let me let me try to change your perspective on what I was saying. So let's take right now, for example, and let's say I, you know, I buy higher-end cards, me personally, right? I buy higher-end cards that are graded a lot of the time and – I go on eBay and I look for these cards. Now, what you what do you think will be more efficient? If I go on eBay or on Facebook and make a post and try to find these cards myself, or if I have hundreds of people's contact information saved that I've already done deals with? Because if you've done a deal with somebody one time, chances are you could do more deals with them in the future because you see along the same lines, right? If they're selling higher in baseball at 95% of comps and that's what I, the stuff type of stuff I like to buy and that's what I like to pay, chances are you'll be able to do a deal in the future. Right, so the the fact they trust you more matters a little bit, especially when you're selling cards, because a lot of the time people just sell you or Venmo you or PayPal you straight cash with no fees, so you're actually making more money and the deals just go quicker. 
So trusting is a big thing. That's part of the reason I put out a lot of this content because we run a lot of ads and instead of you just seeing some random ad of some random guy saying, hey, you can make money buying and selling sports cards, you could actually get to know me and see, I actually know what I'm talking about a little bit and it's a viable way to make money. Trust does matter when it comes to buying things. It does. Um, and also it keeps you organized for your own sake. So you're a lot more efficient when it comes time for buying cards because you just have everyone's information and you can just hit them up. Hopefully that makes sense. Good question. I like it. Uh, Summer says, hey man, I'm about to break into my collection. What's the best way to find out what they're worth? I've been following you on YouTube. I was going to see if you can give me a hand. I got some really cool stuff from hockey, basketball, baseball. So what I would say, uh, Mike, I'll answer your question in one second. I see it on Instagram. What I would say, Summer, is, well, one, you can just shoot me a message on Instagram. I'll help you for free. It's not a big deal. Uh, number two is you want to be looking for stuff that's worthy of getting graded. So if you have older cards, you want to, my standard rule of thumb is I want to try to at least double double my money when it comes to grading cards. So if it's going to cost me $19 to get a card graded, which is the lowest service at the moment, I want to make sure this card's going to net me at least $38 after fees and everything when I sell it. So that's the type of stuff I'd be looking for. If you're looking into cards from the 70s, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, any 80s baseball star where the card's in perfect condition, which is probably not going to happen because it's very rare, 90s basketball of guys like Dirk Nowitzki, Allen Iverson, Tracy McGrady, Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, obviously, those cards are really good to buy as well or to get graded. Like That's the type of stuff you want to be looking for unless you have older vintage cards from like the 50s and 40s, which I doubt because most people don't. And then so <laughs> someone else said, you make the worst kind of sports vis Okay, you make the worst kind of sporting videos, nothing valuable at all, and makes up information. I guess it's people like that that are the ones that think I'm a scam. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for that, Supreme Men. Um, Ma MacArthur Mike says, is there a good way to make money on vintage cards that are from anywhere from decent to good condition to fairly beat up? Big names like Ernie Banks, Frank Robinson, Willie Mays, and so on. Are they worth grading? Yeah, they're worth grading, but the problem is good luck finding them. You can find these cards, but it's just so hard. They get faked so commonly. If you want to make money with vintage cards, this is what my students do. This is like kind of like in my highest level program. If you, I would only do this if you have like 10, 20 grand to mess around with. Is And Mike, you can just shoot me a message if you want, and I'll help you out for free if you have any cards that you were thinking about buying. But the way vintage cards works is like this. It's an amazing way to make money. So let's take a Pete Rose rookie card or something like that. It don't, it usually only goes up over time, but it goes up like this, right? It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. A good example, aha. So this is a good example. This, this is a cheap card, but this Randy Moss rookie card, I bought for $110 at a card show. And this card, if you look in the past on our market movers, market movers is an app that'll tell you the recent data of cards is it only goes up over time, but it goes up like this. It goes down and then up and down, up, down, up, down, up, but it only goes up over time. So what you could do is wait for it to go down. Like this card has sold for over $200 in the past year, but the last sale was like 117 and it's the lowest it sold for in the last year. So what you could do is buy it at its low and I'm okay holding this. I know it's going to spike back up to 160, 180, 200, 150. I know I'll make money on it. And you just have this rolling inventory of vintage cards buying these cards already graded. Now, when I say vintage cards, I'm talking about like cards 70s, 80s, and 90s. PSA 10s, that's the easiest to do the strategy with because once you start to buy graded cards from like the 1950s and 40s and 60s, you start to buy cards that are like PSA 3s and PSA 4s, stuff like that because you're not going to find cards that are 10s and not every PSA 4 is made equal. You could have a PSA 4 of Hank Aaron worth 10 grand and another one to sell for 8 grand just based on the coloring, the corners, the the centering, all that stuff. So these cards are way easier to predict. Like all of them look the same. They're all graded tens and they're just much easier. So I, I just like taking that variable out of it. How do you know when to hold and sell? If I'm getting cards graded, I sell them right away. And if I'm holding them, I try to make 20% if I'm buying a card ready graded. Josh says, let's see, Josh, I can't see your whole question here. Uh, great content and appreciation, appreciate you having sessions like this. In order to have consistent coming in, do you need to purchase and send in daily? So what I recommend people doing is buying, at least this is what I tell students in my program, buying one card every business day, five cards a week to get the ball rolling, right? Because if you're buying cards to get them graded, 
at first, right, you're just spending money, spending money. But if it's going to take about a month or six weeks for these cards to come back to you, you're going to put a, money, a lot of money out there. But eventually, you have cards coming back to you every week. You sell them. You take the money. You reinvest. And it's just like you have this rolling inventory all the time. So hopefully, that makes sense. But do you guys have any other questions that are live on Instagram while I go over? Um, I think that's all I have to go over. Yeah. Actually, I saw something interesting. So I don't really understand this, but maybe one of you guys can enlighten me. So Tom Brady has been getting a lot of flack because he is not good at commentating, is what people say. I enjoy listening to him, but I guess people think he's bad. Tom Brady just started doing something. I was listening to the Colin Coward, and he kind of brought this up. So Colin Coward's like the only sports guy I listen to for some reason. But Tom Brady just started doing something. People have no patience, right? We live in this world of just instant gratification. And because of that, people don't realize Tom Brady just started commentating like three games ago, two games ago, whatever it was. Give the guy some time. People have zero patience in this world. I actually think he's pretty good, personally. I would love to see Tom Brady and Tony Romo do a duel, duel together. That's, a, that's, um, that's what I would like. Mike says, do you think grading through PSA versus SGC is a huge difference? Yeah, it is. So usually a PSA 10 will do about, it depends on the card, but 25 to 50% more than an SGC 10. They're usually about the same difficulty. Just SGC comes back way faster. So if I was like broke, like if you're broke, Mike, and you don't have a lot of money, I would personally go with SGC maybe to begin with. Just You'll make less money, but just the money comes to you much quicker than you could send a PSA because PSA is going to take like five, six weeks to come back to a lot of the time as opposed to like SGC is like a week. So that's what I would say. But I think that's all I got for you guys. Um, yeah, that's all I got in terms of what I wanted to talk about. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out. If you're watching this on YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. I love doing this stuff. If you leave comments, I try to answer these comments in the next podcast. Um, so I look at my comments for the podcast, put them together, answer all the questions. But like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.